Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you were to read verse 9, it says, it reads as follows. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. If I could give you the, the good news translation, you would find it says, remember that the Lord your God is the only God and that he is faithful and he will keep his covenant and show his constant love to a thousand generations of those who love him and obey his commands. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the obeying of his holy word. If I could give you a simple subject or topic for this morning's sermon, this fifth Sunday in January on Young Adult Affirmation Sunday, it would be, he's a keeper. He's a keeper. He's a keeper. Let us praise. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Let me the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let all of God's people say together, amen. Amen. You may take your seat. He's a keeper. Have you ever heard that word, that term? He's a keeper. That's, that, that's, that's a word that I'm pretty sure some of our, our sisters in here can relate to. That, that's the word that is used to phrase when they meet someone that they say is a keeper. They meet boyfriend or whatever, or someone that you, you don't want to let go of. That, that, that is a term that describes a guy that they plan to keep. That the kind of person that cheers you up when you're sad, makes you smile constantly by just being around them. It's, it's, if you look over the web, you find many types of sites that, that talk about he's a keeper. That, that you can find the, the top 15 traits that you know, yes, if they have these 15 traits, then yes, he's a keeper. Some sites have 10. I, I, I know I came across one site that's www.bold.com. That, that it says that if you, your God does these 10 things, then he's a keeper. It says that when life gets crazy and hectic, you always feel like you're his number one priority. He's a keeper. <laughs> that, 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 that even when you don't realize you need him, he's still there for you. That's a keeper. That, that if you cannot imagine a future without him in it, or he can't imagine you without being in his future, he's a keeper. That, that if, if he wants to get to know the people that you love and wants to get to know you better, he's a keeper. That, that your successes brings him joy. That he has no problem with you being able to excel or go up the corporate ladder or being, being able to bring home the bacon. And it's all right with your success then yes, he's a keeper. That, that, that if he actually listens to you and cares about your day-to-day -day life, that, that when you come to talk about your issues of the day, you want to talk about some challenges you're facing, that he can really listen and empathize, then yes, he's a keeper. He's a keeper. If he helps you to become the best version of yourself. In other words, that, that when you're around him, as you spend time with him, you don't go down, but you go up. He helps you to become a better person. He brings out the best in you. Then yes, he's a keeper. He's a keeper if he makes you smile when you want to cry. That, 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 that he has his life together and is truly ready for a mature relationship. Then yes, he's a keeper. The writer, Francis Vitakovic, says in a nutshell that well, you know somebody is a keeper when they're kind, honest, trustworthy, reliable, treats you and others with respect, contributes fairly to finances, loves you despite your flaws, with, with whom you have chemistry, then that's a keeper. 
But she goes on further to say, he's not a keeper if he physically abuses you, emotionally abuses you, cheats on you, is irresponsible, makes you and others feel worthless and unloved, he's not a keeper. Has an addiction such as gambling, drugs, alcohol, which negatively impacts your life and refuses to do anything about it, he's definitely not a keeper. That you remember that commitment precedes happiness and that there's no other way around it, that if you really want to be happy, then you need to have commitment. And if he's willing to be committed, then he's a keeper. That's the perspective in which we find Moses here in the passage today. Moses knows that he's not going to go to the promised land. He, he knows that his successor Joshua will take the people over to the promised land that all the people have known since they've been brought out of Egypt is that Moses was the set leader in it. And as Moses sits there after looking back down memory lane and all that they've gone through knowing that he would not lead the people in the promised land, he decides that he needs to write down in the book of Deuteronomy some words that he needs for the people of God to not forget once he leaves off to the scene. And as he starts to think about how good God has been to his people, how faithful God has been, he decides to say, I need to talk to you about why God is a keeper. That I need for you to know that before, you, when you go into the promised land, that when you see all types of things happening in the promised land, people are going to worship all types of gods with a little g. People are going to do all kinds of things that are different than what God has called for you to do. But I want you to recognize that God is a keeper, that you don't want to let go of God when you go into the promised land. When God gives you your heart's desire, do not forget about God because God is a keeper that as he ends the passage of scripture in chapter 7 of the book of Deuteronomy he lays out the case of while God is a keeper and I think for the times in which we live I think for the days ahead for the people of God the, the context in which God has called us who have been called out of darkness to his marvelous light to live that we need to think about it and know why God is a keeper why you ought not let go of God no matter what you may be going through no matter how difficult the days ahead may seem no matter how funny your money may be getting no matter how much trial and tribulation you may be going through do not forget that God is a keeper, that you don't want to let go of God because God is a keeper. Follow me through the passage today because we find that the Lord our God is a keeper first because the Lord your God has chosen you. That it, it, it's here in the passage that, that he says, look, God had some other choices. That, 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 that was some other people that were more numerous than you. That, there were some other people that maybe if they were doing the choosing, they would have chose somebody different. But God has chosen you. That when you look back over your life, when you look at some of the mistakes that you made, look at some of the places you've been, look at some of the decisions that you have made, when you look at all the options that God could have had and, and, and all the people that God could have chosen, God chose you. God is a keeper because he chose you on your worst day. He loved you with an unchanging hand. That when you was tore up from the floor up, God still chose you. God chose you the people of Israel. God picked them. And when, when you come across Abraham in the book of Genesis, Abraham disappears out of nowhere. And God calls him out of his father's land and says, I need for you to go where I'm going to take you. I'm going to bless you and make you father of many nations. And through your seed, I'm going to bless the world. That, that, that he chose Abraham and Abraham did nothing to earn it but walk by faith. He says, look, the Lord God, children of Israel, when you go into the promised land, after God fights all your battles for you, after God delivers you, after God gives you your heart's desire, after God gives you what you've been praying for, don't forget about God. God is a keeper because God chose you. Oh, when you look back over your life, it's some stuff you know folks would not have chosen you. It's some stuff that God has covered in your life that if folks found out they might not even want to sit next to you right now and even, even say they knew you, but God 
chose you. He says he's a keeper because he chose you. <laughs> Jesus says in John chapter 15, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Let, let, let's get this thing right that, 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 that when you showed up at church, when you showed up with them tears on your eyes, when you heard the gospel preach, make no mistake about it, you didn't choose me. I chose you. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people to me. He says, look, you didn't choose me. I chose you. God predestined you for it. God chose you, and you were not necessarily the cream of the crop. You were not the most educated. You was not the one with all the best answers. You didn't have all the Bible, and you, you weren't walking the straight and narrow. You would have been the least likely person to have showed up in the church. You'd be the least likely person that they would have called to be a deacon or called to be a minister or serve and leadership. You'd be the least likely person to get the blessings that God has given to you. He chose you. He says, look, look, children of Israel, when you go into the promised land, when you see everybody else giving glory to all these gods with a little g, don't for turn your back on God because God chose you when nobody else was thinking a thing about you. That, that, that he heard your parents' cries. He heard when you was in slavery. He heard you and delivered you with a mighty strong hand. God chose you. Your Lord, your God, is a keeper because he chose you. But let's push it a little bit further because he's not only a keeper because he chose you, but he's a keeper because he liberated you. <laughs> he, 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 he says, look, you were back there in Egypt. And you were tasked and they were breaking your back. They were throwing your kids in the river. You cried out to me. I heard your cry and I delivered you. I liberated you. Moses, as he sits there and looks back over his life, as he looks at what the pages of scripture were right about him, his crowning achievement, it was that God used him to deliver his people. That, that when Moses didn't have a word to say, when Moses did not think he was equipped for the task, when Moses didn't know what to say to his people, even to tell them who sent him, and God said, tell them that I am sent me. You let them know that I'm going to deliver them, that, that, that I'm going to bring them out of it. When Moses looked back over his life and looked at all that God had done, he said, God is a keeper, children of Israel, because he delivered you. For some of y'all right now, you might be on the fringe just wondering about your faith. You might be wondering about some things that you're going through. You're wondering as you look at the pages of your life, as you look at the years tick, that whether or not this faith thing is for real, that really will God do what God said he'll do in your life. He's a keeper because he delivered you. Before you backslide, before you slip back into what he delivered you out of, don't forget that he delivered you. He liberated you. Jesus said, who the Son sets free is free indeed. That he, he created you to worship. He set you free to worship him. That when you gave your life to him, you've accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior. He set you free to be who God has called you to be. That you don't have to play no games with God. You don't have to masquerade around like you holy and sanctified air singer. You don't have to act like everything is going okay. You don't have to come to church on Sunday when people ask you how you doing and say I'm blessed and highly favored. And God set you free to be who God has called you to be. And if you're going through some issues, God is able to sympathize with you and understand what you're going through because he created you and he liberated you. He says, look, children of Israel, when you go back into the problem, when you go into the promised land, there's some things that's going on that can bring you back into slavery. Don't forget I brought you out of darkness and to my marvelous light. Don't forget that where I brought you from, I don't want you to go back to. I know when the times get hard. I know when it gets challenging. I know when you see those giants in the promised land. Don't think things were better from where I, better than where I brought you from. Time and time again, as they tarried in the wilderness, they always said things were better than where God had brought you, better where God had brought you from. And that's what we do sometimes, that after we've been walking with God a little while, as it gets 
it's challenging being holy and being sanctified. We find some of our feelings start to get the best of us, and we backslide and slip back into what God has delivered us from. And he says, look, God is a keeper because God has liberated you. In other words, don't go back to what God has brought you out of. God has brought you out with a mighty strong hand. God has delivered you. God has walked faithfully with you through 40 years in the wilderness. God has put up with all of your silliness and your fickleness. God liberated you even knowing that you wouldn't value it like you're supposed to. He says, look, he's a keeper because he's liberated you. As I said, this book that I've been reading about he's a keeper. In fact, it says, and, and he's a keeper, and I'm wondering why he gets on my last nerve. That, that, that she says, sometimes we think the grass is greener on the other side, but then when we get on the other side, we find out that we try to call ourselves doing an upgrade or trade in, that things ain't oftentimes as good as it was and what you had before. That don't get caught up in this consumeristic culture in which we live in, that when you don't get your way or you want to have some Burger King faith, it's not going your way that you want to trade folks in. You want to trade God in or upgrade God to something better you think the culture is showing you he says look he has liberated you he has brought you out he has delivered you he's placed your feet on solid ground remember when you were singing where would I be if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side I would have been dead sleeping in my grave that he made a way out of no way that when you didn't know what you was going to do when you was at your wits end you didn't know how he was going to work those finances out you didn't know how he was going to get your children together you didn't know how he was going to get that job situation worked out you didn't know how he was going to resolve that relationship that God heard your prayers and God delivered you he saved you he says you are holy people you holy, you sanctified. God has liberated you for you to be his treasure that he can show you off to the world. He says, don't go into the promised land and act like what they got to show you is better than what God has to give to you. Don't, don't despise the riches of God knowing that his mercy and grace is supposed to bring about repentance as it says in Romans chapter 2. He says, look, God has liberated you. Your God. Has, deliber has liberated you. Uh, your job didn't liberate you. Your children didn't liberate you. That, your, your, your degree didn't liberate you. Your, 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 your spouse did not liberate you. It was God who liberated you. It was God who brought you out. When you get into the promised land, when God blesses you and gives you his heart, gives you your heart desire, don't get all brand new on God and act like now you got some new way that you can worship God. You got some new way to do things, some new age ways of worship. If, if it worked yesterday, it can work today. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. If, if he saved my mom, he can save me. If he saved me, he can save my children. If he saved my children, he can and save my grandchildren. Jesus Christ is what we need to share the folks. Don't get brand new on God because he liberated you. He says, look, <laughs> the Lord God chose you. You wasn't the cream of the crop. Don't act like you all that in a bag of potato chips. There were some other options, but God chose you. He's a keeper because he chose you. He's a keeper because he liberated you. But he's the keeper, third and finally, because the Lord God is loyal towards you. <laughs> he, 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 he says, the Lord God, when we arrive at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, he says, it is the Lord God, know therefore that he's a faithful God that keeps his covenant and steadfast love to you, that the Lord God is faithful towards you. The Lord God is loyal towards you. And, and that ought to be a word for some of us today that we ought to be able to resonate with because we know there's a lot of folks we've come across in our life that ain't always been so faithful. That we know there's some folks we've come across in life that ain't always been so loyal. There's some folks you thought would be with you that would go through hell and fire for you, but when it got tough, when the road got tough, they got going. They didn't stick with you through thick and thin. There were some folks you thought would be with you right now, but they left you in your time. And he says the Lord God is a keeper because the Lord God 
is loyal. And, 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 and here's the thing about God's loyalty. God's loyalty isn't necessarily predicated on how loyal you've been. <laughs> that, 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 that the Lord God has already factored in your trifleness and your fickleness and your, your, your weirdness when it comes to God and your backslidedness. And God has still been loyal. That's why he says he's the Lord God who keeps covenant. He's the, he's the Lord God who's steadfast in his love, that, that the Lord God is faithful. This, this, this covenant that he talks about with God is this agreement that God makes, this oath that God makes. And God is so committed to himself that God can't be but who God is. And when God makes a promise, as we learned last week, then God keeps his promises because God keeps his covenant. What's in view for us is when we think about when you come down the aisle, you come down the aisle and you make a promise to God, you know, when you get ready to get married and you, you say some vows to one another. It is a covenant before you and God. The expectation is that you're not going to break your covenant. Now, God don't say right here that you keep covenant with him, but God keeps the covenant with you. That's why Abraham in Genesis, when God got ready to make the covenant, he knew Abraham couldn't keep the covenant. He knew Abraham could be faithful in every single thing. So when Abraham went to sleep, he gets the vision and sees God comes and makes the covenant with himself because God can only make a promise with himself that he can, that, that he can keep because man will make promises and man will lie and not keep up to their word. They will come up with an excuse to not keep their promises. But God, even on your word, day keeps his promises to you. He says, look, the Lord God is loyal to you because the Lord God keeps his covenant. That God don't break the covenant because you live in messy. The Lord God don't, don't revoke the covenant. He don't take away his promises because you got on his last nerve. The Lord God, when you want to worship a golden calf, when you forget about the man who God had led you out of Egypt through the power of the Lord God. When you think he's died and you up there want to put up some, some altars and try to worship him, the Lord God still loves you. God still is going to keep his promises. That's why Moses said, Lord God, you, you don't want the people to say you could not do this, that you could not deliver them. So Lord God, you're going to have to show some mercy and some grace to them. So God, in keeping his covenant with us, shows us mercy and grace. The Lord God is so loyal to you, that he shows you mercy and grace when the law says you ought to be judged as a sinner and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life to those who believe in Jesus Christ. He says, look, the Lord God is loyal because the Lord God keeps his covenant. He keeps his promises. The Lord God is so, so loyal that he makes the promises to himself because you can't keep your promises, but God will always keep every single one of his promises. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that every yes in the Lord is amen, that, that when God says yes, then God is going to do what God said he's going to do. God never breaks one of his promises. God keeps all of his promises. And in fact, for God to keep his promises to bring you into an intended end, for God to take you over into the promised land where we step into the New Testament, he sends his only begotten son to be the Passover lamb, to die for your sins, that you will be forgiven, that it will be done, it will be finished, that one day you will be able to see him in heaven and you will be able to worship him. The Lord God makes promises that God will always keep. The Lord God is loyal because he keeps his covenant. But the Lord God is also loyal because the Lord God keeps loving you. <laughs> it is there, he said he's steadfast in his love. Now steadfast, as I told you, is an interesting word because it's one thing to love you when you're loving me all the time. It's one thing to love you when you do everything I tell you to do. It's one thing to love you when you keep all of the law. It's one thing to love a person because they give you everything you want. Uh, it's one thing to love a person because they're nice to you. Because It's one thing to love a person because, because they're always nice to you. It's one thing to love a person because they're always patient with you. They're always listening to you. But the Lord God, his love is so steadfast that even when you are unlovable, even when you don't listen to God, even when you are disobedient, God still keeps on loving you. 
He says he's steadfast in his love. This steadfast is a Hebrew word that, 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 that when you transliterate it means hesed. That this hesed has to do with God's unfailing kindness and devotion towards his people. That, that, that it's based on this, this activeness that God is working on the behalf of his people to show his love for them by taking them over into the promised land, even though they make mistakes, even though they fall short of his glory. That God is engaging with his people in times when we would think that God maybe shouldn't engage with them because they are falling short of his glory. That Lord God's love is enduring that when you mess up God still loves you that when you are unfaithful God is still faithful to you he's saying right here come on over here children of Israel when you get ready to go into the promised land do not forget that the Lord God is a keeper because the Lord God chose you. The Lord God is a keeper because the Lord God has liberated you. The Lord God is a keeper because the Lord God is loyal towards you. He's loyal in keeping his promises. He's loyal in his steadfast love for you, that God is going to love you no matter what you do, that God, you can't do nothing to get away from God. In fact, David said it this way in Psalm 51. He said, if I make my bed in hell, you'll still go down and find me. Now, I can't go high hide from you nowhere. Come on over here, Jonah. You can run to the end of the earth, but I'm still going to find my set person because I love you so much that I'm committed to you. I'm committed to fulfilling my purposes and my plans in your life. My plans are to prosper you. My plans are not to harm you. My plans are to give you hope and bring you into an intended future. Where you seek me, I will be found because the Lord God's love is steadfast. He don't give up on loving you. When you messed up and said that out your mouth, the Lord God did not love you any less. That just because he give you some consequences and some, some punishment, so to speak, for what you've done, don't mean that God doesn't stop loving you. That Lord God is a heavenly father, a perfect father, even though he disciplines us, as it says in the book of Hebrews, I think in chapter 13, it says that he disciplines those whom he loves because that means you are a legitimate child of God. God is steadfast in his love for you and not just in giving you the blessings and giving you what you want, it's also in when he's got to correct you. God is consistent. God don't throw his word away because he, quote, love you. God don't change the rules because he loves you so much and tries to do it another way. God lifts up his standard and he still shows you how much he loves you because he sends his son to die for you. That's why John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, and whomever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him that God's love is steadfast, hesed, grace, mercy, truth, faithfulness. This word to describe how unwavering God is in his commitment towards his people. As I prepare to close, I'm reminded of a, a hymnist by the name of Edith Adeline Gillian Sherry. She was born in the United Kingdom. She lived between the years 1872 and 1897. She was born in a city called Plymouth, Devon. She was disabled at the age of 16 months with poliomyelitis. She walked with crutches her whole life. The death of her only sister, who died at age four when Edith was age six, devastated her. And her going through the ill issues that she faced in life, she looked at all the challenges that she faced in life, the losses that she thought she had in it, and God stirred something up in her heart that she wrote a little hymn by the name of Kept for Jesus, that she said to be kept for Jesus, to be kept by the power of God, to be kept in a world unspotted, treading where Jesus tried. She said, oh, to be kept 
by Jesus. The Lord has felt my feet when I fall. Oh, to be kept by Jesus. She, as she looked back over her life, all the challenges she went through, she recognized that still the Lord God was keeping her, that all things were still working for her good because she loved the Lord and she was called according to his purposes, that the Lord God's love was steadfast in the way he took care of her, that even though she was born into a world where she could not walk, she lost her sister at an early age, that God was still a good God, that God was still keeping her, that God was still sustaining her and providing for her, that even in the midst of a pandemic, you can still be kept by Jesus. He can still keep sustaining you when everybody else is losing their mind and throwing in the towel. Oh, to be kept by Jesus. He can keep you in the fire. He can keep you and bless you on the mountain. He can bless you in the valley. He can bless you with a little bit of money. He can bless you with a lot of money. Oh, to be kept by Jesus. But in case I got my new school saints in here, you say, I don't get those hymns, preacher. I need something new for you to relate this thing to me. I brought one more for you because it was a few years ago. A group by the name of UGK was featuring one of my homeboy crew by the name of Outcast. They had a song that was called I Choose You. That when it opened up, it said, I typed the text to the girl I used to see. That, that I was saying, I choose this cutie pie whom I want to be. I apologize if this message gets you down, but I CC'd every girl that I see around town and said, I hate to see y'all frown, but I'd rather see her smiling. Do I got anybody in here today that I know it's some folks I had to let go when I gave my life to Jesus. It was some folks that after he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light, I had to say, I had to CC them and say, I'm sorry if it hurts you, but I got to make sure my Lord is smiling down on me. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That, that of all the things I think about that he's done for me, that all of the things he's done for me, my soul cries out that I want the Lord to smile and look at me. I want when he comes back looking for faith in the earth that he'll see faith in me. I want him to complete the work that he's begun on me. I want him to say good and well done, my faithful servant. Now you've been faithful with a little bit, I'll be, then I'll make your master over much. Because when I think about how good God has been to me, when I think about the fact that he chose me, when I got to be on the team when nobody else would pick me, when I think about the fact that he liberated me and delivered me out of darkness and placed my feet on solid ground, that when I think about the fact that his unfailing love for me, that he has been loyal to me even when I was not faithful. He has cared for me. He's met all of my needs and supplied it according to his riches and glory. When I think about that on one Friday, when the world was in trouble, when nobody knew what it was going to do, when the disciples had abandoned him, that it was on one Friday on a hill called Golgotha, that's called Calvary, that it was on one Friday when humanity held in the throes of Satan, that it was on one Friday they marched our Lord up that mountain. On one Friday they put him up on that cross and nailed his feet and nailed his hands. That on one Friday when he could get off that cross, he did not get off that cross for the joy that was before him. He endured the shame, despising it, that he could bring me into his family. That he died on that cross. He hung his head and said, it is finished. That it was finished. My salvation was purchased. It was finished that one day I will be set free. It was finished that I will worship him forever. That he did it because he loved me. He says, the Lord children of Israel, after the Lord blesses you, Baptist Church of all nations, after the Lord brings you out of this pandemic, you've been praying for him every single day. You've been reading your Bible in this pandemic. You've been seeking answers from the Lord. After the Lord brings you out of this, remember he's a keeper. He's a keeper. Don't throw him away when you get back on the mountaintop. He's a keeper because he chose you. He liberated you, and he's been loyal to you. Don't give up on God, because God didn't give up on you, as the psalmist said. Let the church say amen. amen.
as we prepare to open the doors of this church, I want to, <laughs> if it ain't clear yet, then I tell you, and the Lord God is a keeper. As the psalmist said, oh, to be kept by Jesus. When storms are raging, God is still right there with you. You got to love the passage, they in the storm, the disciples. Not just because Jesus is with you don't mean you're not going to have the storm. But he'll be there with you in the storm. It's somebody today as we open the doors of this church. You, you, you done tried to be kept by a lot of stuff. A lot of people. Could have been your parents. They didn't keep you properly. They didn't handle you properly. Could have been a relationship that you were not handled, kept properly. You, you, you can't expect to be kept by imperfect people. You need a perfect God to keep you. I introduce you to Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher, the founder, the perfecter of our faith. It begins with Jesus. It's in the middle with Jesus. It ends with Jesus. You looking for peace? It starts with Jesus. You looking for joy, it starts with Jesus. You looking for love, it starts with Jesus. He, he, he first loved us, as it says in 1 John chapter 4. He loves you when you don't know how to love. You want to learn how to love, just look at God and the love that he's shown to you. Oh, to be kept by Jesus. Because God, the Lord God, our God, is a keeper.